So basically, what are the 144,000? If, if I was just going to describe them, I would describe them this way. They're normal, healthy Christians. Normal, what God designed, healthy, operating the way God said, Christians. So, by the way, right now, in this room, with our 120 of us, or however many are here, there are only two types of people, because I assume they wouldn't let you in if you weren't a Christian. Some of you might be faking it, and you're not a Christian. But I'm just going to say we're all Christians here. There are only two kinds of Christians. There aren't, you know, the, remember there are seven varieties in the churches. Five of them were, were unhealthy, maybe six. And one was healthy, or maybe one and a half. You know, this, the people of Smyrna were not supposed to fear, so when they weren't fearing, they were healthy. But basically, they're only healthy and sick Christians. Everybody can be put into one of those. So all of us in this room today are either healthy or sick. How do you know you're healthy? Well, there are seven vital signs in the Scripture of what healthy believers look like. And I, I just want to go through them with you real quick. Healthy believers are prompted by love. I, I think I've said this verse in ten classes. He that has my commandments, Jesus said. In other words... The ones that have the scriptures and keeps the scriptures love me. And everybody that loves me will be loved by my Father. And Jesus said, I'm going to love him. And look what healthy believers get. I will manifest myself to him. How do you get Jesus to manifest himself to you? By loving his voice. He's the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. When we follow him... He leads us in green pastures. Remember Psalm 23? Jesus is embodied in that psalm. He's portrayed in that psalm. He's the good shepherd. He wants to lead us in paths of righteousness. He wants to feed us. He wants to satisfy us. He wants to calm us, make us feel protected. So the first vital sign is we read the Bible, we memorize the Bible, we study the Bible, we think about the Bible, because we love him. If you love someone, you can't get enough of them. You want pictures of them if they're away from you, so you can look at the picture and remember them. You want to talk to them. Remember I told you last week about I was meeting you and I was on the second row and I didn't see the, the uh, earbuds or AirPods in the young lady's ears and she was just looking off in the distance. I said, hello, and she went, oh, and pulled it out and said, yes. And what do you need? And I told her, and then as soon as I was done, whoop, back with him. You know, she just can't get enough of him. See, we're, we're prompted, we're drawn, we're, we're, we just are irresistibly longing for Christ and whatever his word says we want to do. Secondly, healthy believers are trained by grace. Grace trains us what we do with this filthy world we live in, this world of untruths, this world of sin. Uh, this is what Paul told Titus. By the way, Titus 2 is one of the more important little verses in the Bible, or chapters. Titus 2 is the only chapter of the Bible that addresses everybody in the church in one passage. By groupings. You know what it says? The older men, the older women, the younger women, and the younger men. Let me ask you, is there anybody else alive in the church that's not either an older man or woman or a younger man or woman. No. It's the only curriculum in the entire Bible that's addressed by age groups. So there are these specific things God wants from every older man, specific things he wants from every older woman in Titus 2, specific things he wants from every younger woman, and everything he wants from every younger man in Titus 2. It's the only chapter in the Bible that has a curriculum that names the group and what they're supposed to have grace train them to be. It's the first curriculum for the local New Testament church. So this is what it ends with. Paul tells Titus, after you're teaching all these, by the way, there are, there are 12 qualities for every godly man and 12 qualities for every godly woman, young and old, that are right there in that uh, chapter, which is beautiful. And if I was teaching on Titus, I'd go through all of them. But look what the conclusion is. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. What does the grace of God that saved us, what, what does it do? It 
teaches us. It trains us. The same grace that saves us trains us to deny ungodliness. So we're constantly looking in the Word of God, and whatever God defines as ungodliness, we want to have nothing to do with. We want to, as I shared last week, hate what God hates, love what God loves. So we deny ungodliness, we deny worldly lust. What are worldly lusts? Well, it's what you see all around you. The insatiable desire for more of everything. More of everything. I want more shoes. I want more clothes. I want better tan. I want, you know, more hair, especially prevalent if you don't have any, you know, but you want your everything. You, you have worldly desires. We, that isn't what life is. We're supposed to. Grace teaches us to live soberly. By the way, that's the only term that's in all four of the lists for older men, older women, younger men, younger men, sober, sobriety. Uh, see, not getting intoxicated by the world, not going along with the crowd. We should live righteously, which is Christ-like, godly, which is reflecting God in our present age. That's, that's why someone coined the phrase, you know, everywhere you go, proclaim Christ, and when necessary, open your mouth. What it's supposed to be is we're supposed to reflect the character of God just as we go through life in our present world. How do we do that? Verse 13, looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing. What's that? The rapture. This is what motivated the early church. They were looking for the return of Christ, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So a healthy believer is trained by grace. Thirdly, healthy believers make daily choices. They put off what they used to be like. They're renewed in their minds. That's getting interacting with the Word of God, and memorization and meditation. And they put on the new man. And that's what those applications in your journal, that's what that whole thing's about. Putting on, like Mark Strout was just talking about, your identity in Christ. What Jesus wants from us is what our identity is. But we so often don't go to our divine closet and put on, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, you know, compassion and humility and everything that the scriptures say. And so Paul told the Ephesians, constantly we make this daily choice. And if you're healthy, it's just what you do in normal life. You come in all sweaty and grimy and dirty from, you know, plowing the field or mowing the lawn or whatever you do, and you take off the dirty clothes and you take a shower and then you put on clean clothes. That's the spiritual daily choices that we make. In Christ. Fourthly, healthy believers from David, we learn, take a sacred vow. What did David say? Psalm 1013, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It will not cling to me. He said, I don't want to pick up the habits and the mannerisms of the world. I take a sacred vow, and it starts with what I am putting into the most delicate part of my body. You know, some people will sterilize their silverware. I mean, it's like medical instruments before they'd ever put it in their mouth. But unfiltered, they allow anything into the most delicate. Did you know it's more easy to infect your mind than your stomach? Your stomach has enough acid to kill most of the pathogens in water. You know, but boy, our minds are far more easily infected by what we hear and what we see. And so David took this sacred vow. Healthy believers find out that there's stuff that they've allowed into their mind or into their lives that are bad files, kind of corrupt files, you know, like viruses and worms that, that come in our programming. And Hebrews says this, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse? See, cleanse this non-material part of us, our conscience, our mind, from dead works. What are dead works? Things we shouldn't have listened to, things we shouldn't have seen, things we shouldn't have done, things we shouldn't have allowed to take over our emotions, and they're still with us. They're defiling us. And, and the, actually, Jesus offers to cleanse us from all that trash and purge out the bad files. I mean, it's like filing cabinets. You probably don't even know what that is. It used to be when everything was in paper form, they had these metal, like, four-drawer deals that you'd pull out, and they were about this deep, and they would file stuff in them. And that's what our minds are like, only you can't see it. It's just filing cabinets. 
You know what the Lord says? He says, I'd like to open up your drawers and purge through my spirit the grace of God. You say, I want to deny that. I don't want that in my life, that ungodliness, that worldly lust. He says, I will purge those dead works, those things you did in the past that are sinful, that lead to deadening you. I'll purge them. And what happens after he purges? That's Hebrews 9.14. Hebrews 10.22 says, once we let him start purging, we draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. We reclaim boldness. Do you know why a lot of Christians, they're unhealthy, they don't have any boldness. Why? Because they have all these bad files. And they're thinking and remembering and revisiting and reimagining and, and re-listening to stuff that, that God hates. And when we allow him to clean that out, by the way, it really works. I mean, that's what discipleship is. You see the transforming, sanctifying work of Christ. And we have hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, and we have full assurance of faith. What is that? Boldness. The righteous, the Bible says, are as bold as a lion. Here's the last one. Healthy believers are regularly renewing their consecration. Uh, Romans 6, 11 and 19 puts it in the form of presenting our members. Present your members as instruments of righteousness. Romans 12 puts it this way. I beseech you therefore, brethren, so it only is for Christians, by the mercies of God, that's the first 11 chapters of Romans, that you present your bodies. Why? Because we're going to give an account before the judgment seat of Christ what our bodies did. So, whether anybody knows what your body's doing or not, God's keeping track. And you will give an account for whether you did good stuff or worthless stuff with your body and with my body. That, so how do we do it right? We present our bodies every day. We're alive, but we, we sacrifice them. We give the control of them to the Lord. We want to be holy. We want to be acceptable to God. It's our reasonable, boy, that's an interesting word. It's our act of worship. That word is latruo. It's the Greek word for offering worship. Did you know, every time I renew my consecration, every time, and I, I've told you this almost every day, that I get out of bed and step in my little circle that I can see on the floor, and I, I again say, focus me, Lord, on you, and I want you to control my life, it's an act of worship. Holy, reasonable service. And what happens when we renew our consecration? We aren't squashed conformed, squashed into the mold of this world, but we're metamorphosized. That's where that Greek word metamorphosis is. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind. And we prove, only then when we consecrate ourselves, can we know what is God's good, acceptable, and perfect will. And that's a healthy Christian. And that's what the 144,000 are going to be. And that's what you and I are supposed to be today. Are you healthy?